We're primarily dealing with material from Chapter 11, but we're also going to pick up casualty losses from Chapter 8. For an individual, these are a itemized Schedule A deduction. For businesses, they are deductible for AGI. And then we're going to do the tax deferred exchanges from Chapter 11. So casualty and theft loss deductions. Our first question is, what is a casualty? All right. So we'll discuss what losses qualify as casualty losses. And remember, if we're talking about personal use property, we're talking about overriding the general rule that says you do not get to recognize losses from dispositions of your personal stuff. And then we'll do the math to figure out the final amount of the deduction and when you can take the deduction. So personal use property, that's your junk, your stuff, things that you did not buy with a profit motive. All right, these would not be deductible without this provision. You need a sudden, unusual, and unexpected event to have a casualty. And by now, you're all working through your RQ4. And in RQ4, several of you had, is this a casualty or not? If my oil line breaks, is that a casualty? If my car falls through the ice, is that a casualty? All right. It's not unusual for a, a oil line to break, especially in an older car. But it is pretty unusual for the ice to melt out from under you and plunge you into the river. And so one of them would be a casualty, the other would not. Can't have normal wear and tear. Uh, that gets us back to that oil line, right? Or uh, just things wearing out because they get old. Not everyday accidents either. Your kid parks his bike in the driveway, you run over it. That would not create a casualty deduction. You are washing dishes, you take your diamond ring off, it falls into the garbage disposal. That is presumably an accident that might not qualify for a casualty, but the dollar amount might be big enough that you'd want to go out to CCH and research that one. Not things like erosion or termites because they take a long time to happen. And the assumption is that if you are a responsible homeowner, you are expecting your property taking care of those things. Now that said, if you were invaded by those army termites that can eat your house in six months, then you would certainly have a different argument to make. So it just depends on the facts and circumstances as to whether something's sudden, unusual, or unexpected. And then you can be at fault, but not willful. So you have too much to drink, it's a dark and stormy night, and you drive off the road and smash up your car, it's definitely your fault, but that wasn't your object, obje, object of getting into the car, and so you would probably be okay. Uh, some of you might remember the movie War of the Roses, and towards the end, she takes her huge SUV and totally smashes up his fancy little bitty sports car, and that would definitely be willful, and if you were to admit the true facts to the IRS, they would not allow this to be a casualty loss. And if you weren't careful, you probably wouldn't get your insurance reimbursement either. For the purpose of finishing up this course, uh, I will simply tell you it was a casualty. And it'll be your job to figure out the amount of the deduction. By how much does taxable income go down? Note that for the moment, we're focusing on personal use property. That's all your stuff that has had a sudden, unusual, and an unexpected demise. All right, so you're looking for the decline in fair market value limited to the adjusted basis. So it's the decline in fair market value caused by the casualty. All right, if you just had your house appraised at $2 million and it burns to the ground, your decline in fair market value would be $2 million. But if you only spend $100,000 for the house, you're only going to get $100,000. So they will it ultimately not allow you to take a deduction that's based on any more than the dollars you actually have in the game. On the other hand, if the damage was only $25,000 and your adjusted basis was $100,000, you would just get the deduction of $25,000 because the rest is still there in good shape. 
And the decline of fair market value can be measured several ways. One is to get an appraisal before or after. And yes, there may only be ashes for the appraiser to work with after, but they're very clever about using information to get an approximation. The alternative is the repairs it takes to return to the original condition. So if this is your house, you can't add a new fancy slate roof and an extra bedroom and then count that in your repairs. You can only count what it would have cost you to get back your asbestos ceiling and repair the existing rooms. And then, uh, like I said, anything you do fancy that would increase the fair market value would not be covered in this. Once you've determined the starting point for determining whether you have a casualty loss, we have a series of reductions that we're going to reduce from there. Note that we're still talking about personal use property. We have a different set of rules for business use property. All right, the first thing you do is reduce each occurrence by $100. This is each occurrence, one $100 floor or reduction. Seems like a very small amount of money, but this provision has been in the tax code a long time. And you don't have to look back more than the 1950s for $100 to be a lot of money. So nowadays, it's just an irritation. Prior to this, it would create a burden on a lot of people to deduct a casualty loss that was actually a significant economic loss. So it's each casualty. So if you go walking in Central Park in New York City, you get mugged. They take your fancy raincoat, your watch, your, your phone. You have one $100 reduction against the total value of those items. You get out of the hospital. You go back to Central Park. You get mugged again. One second $100 coming off of that amount. So the total for the year. And we're assuming here that the total for the year is going to be a negative number as you net all your personal casualty losses after the $100 floor. You add them all up. If you net negative, then you're going to reduce that negative number by 10% of AGI. So you can see that a lot of relatively painful but somewhat minor casualties are not going to create a tax deduction. A hurricane comes through, you lose your power, you're out $1,000 worth of food in your freezer, you had to throw it all away. $1,000, you're down to $900 once you take into account the floor. And it would not take a lot of AGI to totally wipe out that other $900. So casualty losses only benefit you if they're fairly substantial. So once you have done the netting, and reduced by 10% of AGI. Then you have a deduction that's from AGI, which means you must itemize in order to take advantage of that deduction. All right. Lots of taxpayers take a standard deduction. So this is another way that you can go through all that math and not get much benefit. If your casualty loss turned out to be $3,000 and you don't own a house, give a lot to charity, pay a lot of state income taxes, you probably are just going to take the standard deduction, which means you've done a lot of math but haven't accomplished much. But it is not 2% or 3% limited, which is good, because you've already reduced by 10% of AGI. And so the government assumes that they have whittled you down enough, they're ready to let you have a deduction. So now let's turn to the deduction for business use property. We do have a concept called return of capital which means if you spend money to make money, there is a provision in the code somewhere that will enable you to recover any basis you have left if you're no longer using the property. So the question of interest is whether it's an ordinary or a capital 1231, because that can ultimately make a difference in the bottom line going on. So we're not going to get into the subtle nuances of what makes a business use casualty. I will simply tell you it was a casualty affecting business use property. And then you're going to follow this set of rules. All right. The, we start out with the same rule that we have for personal use property. Decline in fair market value limited to adjusted basis. So if this was a building and I could have sold it for $3 million, but I only had 500000 of basis, if it burns to the ground, I only get the 500000 
If there's only $50,000 worth of decline in fair market value, I only get the $50,000. And we measure the decline in fair market value the same way as we did with the personal use property. And there is one slight difference here. If your property is completely destroyed, you get your adjusted basis, even if it is larger than the decline in fair market value. Right? So you've got some equipment. You could only sell it for about $5,000 right before the disaster. But your adjusted basis is $30,000. Remember our return of capital doctrine. You're going to get to deduct the full $30,000. Because when you spend money to make money, at the end of the day, if the underlying thing you bought to make money with is no longer there, you're going to get to deduct the rest of your basis. Not the $100 reduction doesn't play a role here. And no 10% of AGI offset because it should be a business deduction deductible for AGI. So remember, the AGI offsets only apply to items being deducted on the Schedule A. So now we're going to look at an example of an automobile. It could be personal use property or business use property. I will tell you that up front. And then you will use your rules to determine what the deduction is. So let's look at the underlying facts first. We have an auto. Its basis is $12,000. So if it's my personal use property, then I probably spent $12,000 for it because there are very few things that reduce the basis of personal use property. If it was business property, whether I say basis or adjusted basis, I mean this is what's left after you consider all cost recoveries. Been completely destroyed. So my adjusted basis is 12000 I need to know my fair market value before and after in order to know my change in fair market value. If I tell you something's completely destroyed, the after is going to be zero. Right? Completely destroyed means there's no salvage value, there's nothing there but a heap of rubble that you're probably going to have to pay somebody to tow off. So the blue book value, which is one way to measure fair market value, $6,000. So my change in fair market value would be $6,000, right? It went from six to zero. And so that's my change. No other casualty events during the year, so we don't have to worry about netting before we potentially reduce by 10% of AGI. So the question is, what's the loss deduction if it's a personal use vehicle versus a business vehicle. So think about that for a minute. Where would you start if you were personal use? Would you start with the 12,000 or the six? If you were business use, what would you start with? The 12,000 or the six? The answer is not the same on this set of facts. All right, so we'll go through the personal use first. And then on the other half of the slide, we'll have the rules for the business. Okay, so we're going to start with the 6000 because that's the decline in fair market value. The government's position is that other 6000 declined because you were using it. And there's no deduction for your personal stuff unless that deduction comes from a casualty loss. So we've got to reduce by insurance proceeds. I haven't talked about that yet, but we have a slide coming up. Reduce by your $100 because it's one incident. Reduce by 10% of AGI and then deduct from AGI. So you can see that that $6,000 could very quickly get whittled away depending upon the insurance proceeds and the size of your AGI. Business use, we're going to start with the adjusted basis because it was completely destroyed. Once again, we must reduce by insurance proceeds. But after that, we're basically done for the business use property. No $100 floor, no 10% reduction from AGI, and our deduction will be for AGI instead of from. For both business and personal property, you must apply for an insurance reimbursement or at least reduce the mass as if you had. This provision was rather late to the game. Prior to this, people would make a choice between do I file for an insurance and have them raise my rates? Or do I just take my tax loss, figuring that in the long run, without my rates going up, I'll be just as happy. So nowadays, uh, if you have insurance, you must make that reduction for what the insurance company would have paid you 
whether you have actually applied or not. And sometimes the insurance can cause a realized gain, especially on things like a building, because it's very common for buildings to insure for replacement costs. I know that some people are now insuring their cars for replacement costs, but that can get really expensive. And so most of us just have traditional insurance. And when our car gets damaged, we're hoping we'll get something uh, because that's the way the insurance companies work, right? So when we finish this material, we will be dealing with items where the insurance company is going to give you more than your basis. And so you will have a net realized gain on the transaction. And we'll go through the rules for that when we get there. Those are the involuntary conversions that are discussed in Chapter 11. So the timing of the deduction, normally you would simply take the deduction in the year the casualty occurred. But part of the provision for casualty losses is recognizing that you're having a hardship. And so there's a couple rules here that are designed to help out people. The first is... If it's a national disaster area, you can amend last year's return. So when a big flood or a big fire comes through, it is not uncommon for governors to immediately get on the phone and petition for this particular disaster to be declared a national disaster area. That gets you FEMA, and it also gets the individuals the right to amend last year's return. So if you had a casualty in December here, not that big a deal because you could file your 2014 tax return uh, January, February, as soon as you get the paperwork together. But put that disaster in January of 2015, it's going to be 14, 15 months before you file your 2015 return. And so it's a lot more helpful for getting the money back for you to put it in your 2014 return, especially if you haven't even filed 2014 yet, because you don't have to go through the process of amending. So to the extent that the disaster reduced your taxable income, you're going to get money back faster if you're in a national disaster area and you choose to take advantage of the one-year early rule. And then there's the issue with theft. You have some gold coins in the bottom of a drawer. You haven't opened that drawer in years. You decide you want to cash them in. You reach in there and they're gone. You have no idea what babysitter to blame, right? And so the rules simply say that the moment you open that drawer and discover the loss, that becomes the date the theft has happened, and that's when you're going to take the theft deduction. Right? It just makes life a little cleaner and a little easier. So now we're moving on to Chapter 11, the Tax Deferred Exchanges. I really should change that because, as you should remember, the sale of the personal residence is actually an exclusion versus a deferral. So we've got two deferrals and one de exclusion that we're going to talk about. All right, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time reviewing amount realized, adjusted basis, gain or loss, holding periods. And then we'll deal with the sale of the personal residence. On the right set of circumstances, this is an exclusion. And then we'll deal with like-kind exchanges and involuntary conversions. My outline doesn't quite follow the book because we're actually going to talk about involuntary conversions and then like-kind exchanges. I think involuntary conversions are a little easier to follow, and that sets you up to be successful with the like-kind exchanges, which are just a little bit more complicated. Now, all the way through here, we're going to focus mostly on the math. This will be like the loss limits, where we're not going to drill down into the rules too deeply. I will ask you gain realized, gain recognized, gain deferred, and what, if any, effect does this have on the basis of your new property? And then these things that are coming up in blue, they are more things that are discussed in your book. We're not going there at all. You will get a very brief discussion, maybe five minutes, of reorganizations in your corporate class. Uh, much too complicated to try to cover quickly. And so back when we had a Master's of Tax program, we had an entire semester dedicated to these. So we're going to do just the three, sell a residence, like kind of exchange, and voluntary conversion. We're going to ignore the rest of the chapter. So just some definitions. These things should be old hat. Realize gains or losses. All right, that's the difference between what you're getting and your basis you're giving up. So this is the first level of the math. 
right? What did you get minus what you gave up will be your realized gain or loss of any property sold or disposed of during the year. So the recognized gain or loss is simply that which you are bringing into your tax return to either increase or decrease taxable income. All right, but you don't know how much you've realized until we go through the next two slides or recognized until we know how much we have excluded or deferred because you would do that first. The amount you realize minus that which you exclude or defer would be that which you're recognizing. A deferred gain or loss is simply that amount of the realized gain or loss that the tax code lets us defer or kick down the road to recognize in a subsequent event. And we're just going to focus on the involuntary conversions. You have had a casualty where you're insured for more than your basis, so there's a gain being triggered, or you've engaged in a like kind of change. We've got slides coming up on both. The deferred gain or loss will trigger with a subsequent event. That subsequent event is most commonly you're disposing of the replacement property. Excluded gain or loss. Exclude means gone away forever. We only have two of them. We will never recognize the gain on the sale of the personal residence, but only if you meet the conditions for the slides that are coming up. And then harping, harping losses. You never get to re recognize losses on the sales of personal use property. The only exception to that is not technically a sale. It's a casualty loss where you got some insurance potentially, but not enough to trigger an involuntary conversion gain. You may remember that how you acquire property will determine your basis. It will also determine your holding period for determining whether something is long term or short term. In a fully taxable transaction, that means one in which you did not have any deferrals, uh, your basis should be your purchase price. Everything you gave up, the cash, the debt relief, the services you did, uh, any debt you assumed, all of that, which would have been uh, the other guy's amount realized, becomes your adjusted basis. And your holding period begins on the date that you acquired. So you, you will be long-term or short-term strictly determined by how long you have actually owned it. When you get a gift, you get a carryover basis. Remember, the normal rule is that your basis is the basis of the transferor potentially adjusted by the gift taxes if it's an appreciated gift. In a depreciated gift, the rules are more complicated, but in both cases, the holding period of junior, the person getting the property, will include that of the transferor. So if grandma owned it 15 years, junior gets it on Monday and has sold it by Wednesday, junior will have a long-term, presumably capital gain or loss. When you inherit property, the general rule is it's fair market value at the date of death or six months later, depending on what the executor wants to do. You don't get any choices. You just get information. This is frequently referred to as a step up in basis because it's not uncommon for the thing you inherit to have originally cost grandma $1,000 could currently be sold for $20,000. But sometimes you actually get a lower basis than you would have if grandma had just sold it because it's that depreciated property. So she spent $20,000 for it. It's only worth $5,000. If she would have sold it, she would have had a potential capital loss. You have your $5,000 and that's it. That will be your basis going forward for all purposes. The holding period is always long term. No exceptions to that. So grandma buys something three days ago, you inherit it two days ago, and you immediately sell it yesterday, and it's only been in your family for three days, but you would have a long-term holding period for determining any gain or loss. But since its value would be fair market value at the date of death, it is unlikely that you're actually going to have any type of gain or loss, because if you sell it immediately, it's very likely that your amount realized and your adjusted basis will be the same number. 
Substitute bases is a lot like carryover bases, but we no longer have that same property. So that's going to apply in this chapter. When our house burns down, we buy a new house, or we engage in a like kind exchange, we don't have the same equipment, but our basis is going to be determined in reference to the property that we gave up. All right, so it will happen when there is a gain or loss deferral, and we're going to be valuing the new property based on an adjustment to reflect the gain or the deferral. Uh, and so this is referred to as a substituted basis. All right. well, the general rule that we're going to use is start with the fair market value of the new property, reduce by gains postponed, or increase by postponed losses. And that second bullet is what we did with the wash sales. You add the loss you did not get to recognize to your basis in the new stock. Now, there are other ways to get to the same mass. If you are one of those few who actually are reading the book, I think it's best to just focus on this rule rather than learn both rules. That gets you to exactly the same place. So always start with the fair market value of the new property and then reduce by postponed gains, increase by postponed losses. Postponed and deferred are the same thing. The next four slides talk about the exclusion that's available from the sale of a principal residence. I'm not going to read them bullet by bullet. We'll just give a couple highlights and then you can read them yourself or better yet, read the information in the book. Okay, this is the 250,000 or 500,000 if you're married filing joint gain that you can exclude just like we discussed for W4. To qualify, you must have use the property, owned and used it as your principal residence for at least two of the five years preceding the sale. Now that does not have to be the 24 months prior to the sale. It just has to be a total of 24 months in that five year period. It could even be three months in year one and five months in year two and the rest in year four. Um, and you would qualify for this exclusion. And you're only allowed to claim the exclusion once every two years. So there are some information here about the married filing joint. Uh, the short story here is that it's possible for one of them to own the house or both of them as long as they both are occupying for two of the past five years and then neither one is using that two-year rule. And then uh, there is always an exception. Uh, the two years can be uh, reduced if you are forced to sell because you've had a change in your place of employment. They transfer you to Boston after only 10 months here in Richmond. Uh, you are too sick to continue to live on your own or other unforeseen circumstances that would be facts and circumstances. Uh, and then uh, if you needed unforeseen circumstances, there are nice complex IRS regulations that you could read to see if you could fit your situation into one of those. If you do qualify for an exclusion, you're going, or an exception, you're going to prorate the exclusion using X over 24 months, where X is the smaller of the aggregate number of months you owned and used during the five-year period, or the number of months since the exclusion was last used. So if you uh, make qualify for 70% of the uh, exclusion, you would get 70% of either the 250000 or 500000 to be the maximum amount of gain that you could exclude. That brings us to the topic of involuntary conversions. They are similar to casualty losses, except you don't need the sudden and unusual, and you have insured your property for more than its adjusted basis. So the insurance company's check is treated as an amount realized and that will trigger a gain realized and this provision will allow you to defer that gain recognition if you do all the steps correctly. All right, so it is a tax deferral. That means that when you dispose of the replacement property at a later date, the potential for that gain recognition gets triggered. The provision does not apply to losses. If you have a involuntary conversion that generates a loss, that is a business casualty probably. If it's your personal use property, you will not be able to take a deduction unless you can get the sudden and unusual conditions met. 
you're going to recognize gain to the extent that you don't spend all of the insurance company's money. So if the insurance company gives you a million dollars and you don't spend the whole million dollars, you will recognize part of your gain. And then the way we make sure that there is the deferral is the replacement property. You're going to adjust the basis by making it smaller for the amount of gain you have deferred. And so in theory, at least, when you sell the property in the future, that smaller basis will cause you to recognize the gain that you deferred on the first transaction. So we're going to defer the recognition by reinvesting in qualified property. We've got some slides later that talk about qualified property, but I don't want you to overfocus on that. In this area, we're pretty much just going to focus on the math, just like we did with the loss limits. I want you to be able to calculate the gain or loss, determine how much of any you can defer, how much you must recognize and calculate the basis in the replacement property. If you can do that, you will survive our last meeting together. So we do have some time limits for the reinvesting. Uh, the current year plus two tax years. So if you have a involuntary conversion in December of 2014, that gives you just this month and two more tax years you must have acquired and utilized the replacement property by December 31 of 2000, what's that, 15, 16. Uh, if something happens in January of 2015, you basically pick up more months because you've got all of 2015 and then two more tax years. Losses are treated as not deferrable. So you will either recognize them if you qualify if it's personal use property, you would only qualify if you had a casualty loss that met the rules we started with. 